everyone and welcome to QOE Net OSC 1. The title of today's presentation is Current and Emer Emerging Standards ISO. The expected duration of the presentation is one hour. Before we start, I need to point out the way of comments and questions for today. Instead of the regular verbal questions after the presentations, questions will be submitted via the public chat function located on the left side of the screen, which then will be addressed by the presenter. So if you have a question, you can immediately write it on the chat and it will be answered after the presentation. Dear presenter, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Hello, everybody. So I uh, I'm going to talk about uh, current and emerging standards, uh, especially with a particular focus on ISO. Uh, for those of you who don't know me or you have not met me, my name is Toraj Ibrahimi. I'm a professor at EPFL, and I have the pleasure of being the first uh, speaker of this series of uh, online short courses. Um, uh, let me start first uh, by telling you a few things uh, before we get a little bit more um, um, into details. Uh, first of all, I'm going to uh, uh, cover uh, mainly MPEG and JPEG uh, standards within the ISO. As uh, many of you know, ISO is actually a very uh, large standardization organization. They literally have thousands of standardization committees, subcommittees, uh, taking care of standardizing all sorts of things. It uh, can be as simple as what is the um, diameter and uh, shape of uh, uh, screwdrivers all the way to how uh, processors, architectures uh, should look like. And uh, so this is a very, very vast, of course, um, a, a scope. Uh, I'm not going to talk, obviously, about many of it. In fact, I'm going to mainly concentrate on the information uh, technology side. And even there, uh, still the scope is huge. And I will mainly focus on imaging and video. Uh, when I say video, um, of course, I refer to uh, MPEG standards also. Now, MPEG standards also include a number of specification that have to do with uh, uh, coding of uh, speech and uh, audio, as well as uh, how to, uh, from system point of view, how to uh, put them together, and a lot of actually issues that surround uh, the system issues and protection of content, etc. None of these I'm going to talk about. Uh, I will mainly concentrate on the coding of images and video and how, what is going on, what has happened, and what are the trends uh, in uh, these two standardization uh, committees that are both under the ISO. Um, and uh, uh, this is really uh, the, 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 the center of, of the discussion today. Another thing I want to uh, immediately mention is that uh, there's going to be another uh, online short course that, about ITUT. I uh, saw in the um, um, abstract that at least there were some mention of video coding. Uh, I don't know how in-depth uh, uh, Alexander Rocker will go. I sent him an email, but he replied to me. So I'm going to um, uh, going to um, uh, give you some information about that. But um, since uh, uh, some of it probably will be covered in ITU, I'm not going to uh, spend as much time under uh, the uh, the things that uh, overlap with ITU uh, uh, at this uh, uh, short course, hoping that this will be covered, of course, by Alexander Rock. At least it is in his uh, the abstract of his uh, his talk. Um, so uh, maybe the best way to start is to actually position uh, both JPEG and MPEG. Uh, JPEG and MPEG, uh, for many of us, are um, very non, uh, non uh, well known brands. Um, in fact, even probably a lot of people who are not into technology uh, know about them. Uh, they are both quite uh, quite well known. Now, uh, um, they are actually um, uh, subcommittees that are under the auspices of uh, ISO, but sometimes a few other 
uh, standard organizations. In case of JPEG and MPEG, uh, everything is under uh, what is called ISO IEC JTC1. JTC1 is a joint technical committee, number one, because there is only one of them, uh, that has put together experts from ISO and uh, IEC, which is another standardization committee, which deals mainly uh, uh, with uh, hardware and devices. And uh, JTC1 scope is, is, is information technology. Uh, so this is also very vast, as I said before. Uh, it can be as large as how the interfaces should look like, uh, what should be the format of emails, uh, and so forth. Um, now, uh, specifically, uh, there is a subcommittee called SC29, as you see in this, uh, um, uh, probably I can actually use a pointer here. Uh, yeah, SC29 is, is, uh, is a subcommittee that basically take care of um, issues that have to do with coding, uh, coding of multimedia uh, uh, content. Um, SC29 is actually organized itself in a rather more or less complex way. On one hand, it has something called advisory committee. I'm going to get to that. Um, there are on currently two advisory committees. One of them is called advisory committee for management, and the other one is a registration authority because some of the uh, technologies that are standardized under S29 require that they have to be registered in a in a registration authority, and uh, for that purpose, there is a there is a need for an advisory committee. Uh, other than that, a lot of technical work gets done under what is called working groups. Now, all SCs in uh, uh, under JTC1 have working groups, and in case of SC29, we have really two working groups. One is called Working Group 1, and the other one is called Working Group 11. And in fact, uh, Working Group uh, 11, under it, it has only one big project, which is called MPEG, although I say only, it's actually a huge um, uh, uh, number of activities. And uh, under WG1, there are actually two type of activities that are happening. One is the, uh, the well-known JPEG activities uh, uh, that has uh, mainly its uh, focus on uh, still images, but also moving images, um, uh, as long as there, there is no motion compensated in them. And the other one is uh, what is referred to as JBIG, which is uh, for um, uh, bi-level image coding. In fact, JBIG stands for Joint Bi-Level Image Group. Uh, whereas JPEG uh, stands for Joint Photographic Expert Group, as the name shows, and MPEG, uh, probably you all know, stands for Moving Picture Experts Group. Um, now, uh, things become a little bit more complicated because, in fact, in both cases, uh, also some of the experts uh, do their work jointly with ITUT. Now, ITUT is, of course, the third organization committee uh, under uh, United Nations, it uh, has a special sector called T, which stands for telecommunication. And as you see, uh, actually, uh, JPEG and JPEG both are um, a, a jointly under uh, also uh, auspices of ITUT. The, the, the letter J actually uh, uh, means that it's joint. Um, in case of MPEG, things uh, are planned a little bit, are structured a little bit differently. Uh, um, and uh, in fact, uh, MPEG uh, has uh, some subgroups within it. Uh, actually, in this case, two, one, two of them. Uh, one is called uh, a joint uh, um, uh, coding team, and then the other one uh, on video coding. And then the other one is called a joint coding team V3 which stands for 3D content. And these are also jointly under the auspices of uh, ITUT on one hand and uh, MPEG, which means indirectly also uh, uh, ISO and IEC uh, on the other hand. So this is, this is roughly to position, in fact, uh, both JPEG and MPEG within this more or less uh, complex way uh, in which uh, uh, standards are uh, 
are uh, uh, are, are defined uh, in in case of image and video. Now let me uh, go very very quickly uh, through a few things uh, regarding SC29. Uh, so I already mentioned SC29 is uh, really mainly focusing on coding of audio, picture, and in general multimedia and hypermedia information. The area of work is of course mainly compression of these uh, uh, type of information, uh, but also all sorts of things that one can do to control, to search, to annotate this kind of uh, information. Uh, there is one exception to that, and this is a character coding. SC29 does not do character coding. In fact, uh, uh, this uh, work is done under another uh, group, uh, another subcommittee of JTC1 called SC2. Uh, currently, the chairman and the secretariat through that uh, is uh, in Japan. The chairman is Kotaro uh, Asai, who is uh, a Japanese uh, professor uh, in, uh, based in Tokyo. Um, uh, uh, I mentioned uh, AGM. Actually, AGM Advisory Group for Management is a very, very important group. Uh, they do a lot of management-related things. Um, uh, mainly, it advises uh, SC29 and the working groups I just mentioned, 1 and 11, currently on matters of management. And um, especially, uh, it tries to gather information when there is need for information. It tries to identify uh, problem areas that have to be addressed uh, in SC29. If there is a need for a new standard, if there is, a, there is, there is, a, there is a interaction that have to be made, uh, either between WG1 and WG11 or uh, between S29 and other uh, committees and uh, standards that have uh, an interest in uh, st uh, standardizing. And uh, AGM does not make decisions itself. It just prepares uh, and recommends things and uh, sends them to SC29. And SC29, in fact, uh, makes the decision of how to proceed based on these recommendations. Uh, the convener, which is a special, actually, word that is used in this case, I mean, which basically is synonymous of chairman, is uh, Dr. And Andrew Tesher. Uh, he is uh, based in the United States, actually, currently working at Microsoft. Um, WG1 that I just mentioned, this is really the group, the working group that takes care of both JPEG and JBIG, as I told you. Um, it uh, has, of course, as focus, uh, coding, compression, processing, and uh, uh, everything that has to do with still pictures. Of course, the, the famous JPEG uh, uh, file format is, is one of the results of, uh, of this, uh, this group. Uh, the convener, the chairman of this, uh, of this uh, working group is actually me, so I can probably give you <laughs> some first-hand information about that. And, um, you can actually find a lot of uh, uh, details and uh, more um, information that probably I won't have uh, the time to go at uh, uh, the depth that it should be on the website that is mentioned here, which is very simple to remember. Um, the other group, WG11, is very similar to WG1, uh, just that its uh, focus is uh, more on moving pictures and also audio. So as I mentioned before, uh, I'm not going to talk at all about the audio part uh, and only talk about the moving picture uh, part of it. Uh, the convener of, uh, of, this, uh, of this working group, so MPEG, is Leonardo Gariglione, who is um, uh, based in Italy. And uh, there also uh, there is a, a website uh, you can uh, refer to uh, uh, with much, much more details than what I'm going to uh, cover uh, during this uh, first uh, OSD. Now, uh, one thing that probably uh, is important to tell you right in the beginning is how are we, uh, if you are interested, uh, how is it possible to, uh, to join actually either JPEG or MPEG committee? Um, so uh, this is not like a conference. This is not like a, 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 conf a, a project. Uh, like uh, ours, uh, that you can just simply, you know, uh, join. It needs, uh, because uh, there is standardization going on and these things are uh, decided at the 
at the country levels, uh, it requires that people are actually nominated by a specific country. So there are a large number of countries that are actually uh, represented in ISO. Uh, some of them are represented in JTC1, and then a, uh, some a smaller uh, portion of them are represented under SE29. And um, um, then there are various countries, uh, 20 plus countries, actually almost close to 30 countries, uh, that uh, that uh, have representative in either SC29 or WG1 or WG11. There's a huge overlap between them, by the way. And um, so in case uh, somebody, like one of you, or anybody who wants to join this, uh, you have to contact, actually, uh, uh, your national body and uh, representative and uh, in fact the uh, procedure on how to really join and become accredited changes country from country so I cannot really in general tell you uh, how it is done because every country decides how uh, it is done uh, often it uh, um, requires that some fee is paid uh, uh, some meetings internally inside every country are held uh, twice, three times a year, uh, and it is important to at least uh, um, attend some of them, uh, if not all. And uh, uh, there are a number of rules to be followed that uh, by basically asking, uh, the national bodies will send information about what are the internal procedures and what are the rules of, of being an expert in um, accredited by a national body. Now, one thing that is very, very important uh, to always remember is that in JPEG and MPEG uh, standardization committees, uh, expert, they do not represent their companies or their organizations, like the university. They re represent themselves as experts and obviously, of course, their national body. And often, one of the rules of national bodies, that's why they want uh, to, to know people and you know, these people have to basically know about the certain rules. Uh, uh, one of them is obviously that if you are expert accredited by a given national body, you cannot oppose uh, at the JPEG or MPEG meeting their their views. So if you want to oppose that, you have to do it first internally, and then you know whatever the final decision of that national body. Then this is this is what you have to really basically endorse also when you go into into these meetings. Now, uh, another important thing also to, 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 to keep in mind is that uh, there are lots of documents that are contributed and get generated at every uh, JPEG or MPEG meeting. Now, uh, there is always a question, what is the status, actually, of, uh, of these documents? These documents are internal documents. Uh, of course, some of them are uh, uh, tagged and labeled as public. Of course, we are not talking about that. But when there is no uh, indication that a document is public explicitly, then these documents are internal. Now, there are a number of um, um, uh, issues, especially related to copyright and, uh, and intellectual property, like patents, etc., that immediately flow from that. Uh, that's one of the reasons that these documents are considered as, as internal, and because they are internal, uh, they have uh, uh, been put, they always uh, are put in a, in a server that is password protected. And the password is actually provided by a mechanism that is under the uh, control of national bodies. So no expert who is not accredited by a given national body can have access to these documents. Um, another thing that is very, very important is that uh, once one becomes uh, an expert, in a national body, uh, uh, one gets actually enrolled on a, a ISO um, a database uh, that is called the ISO Global Directory that uh, uh, that actually gives uh, uh, the necessary um, credentials like username, password to that uh, particular person who is the expert uh, to have access to all the documents, but also all the news and. Uh, information about when uh, meetings happen and uh, what are the uh, uh, progress that are that are taking place um, now uh, in addition to uh, these uh, uh, these groups and uh, 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 subcommittees I mentioned to you 
Uh, there is also a uh, ephemeral, you could call it, a uh, structure that is always put in place between face-to-face uh, -face meetings of uh, the um, working groups. Um, uh, these are referred to as ad hoc groups. Ad hoc groups exist only between meetings and they have very, very well-defined uh, uh, mandates and objectives and they even often have very well-defined deliverables. Uh, they only exist between meetings. So as soon as a, a MPEG or a JPEG meeting starts, uh, these uh, these ad hoc groups cease to exist, and the experts, you know, they they they, they are of course as always uh, members of the of the working groups. Uh, they uh, either MPEG or JPEG, uh, but this gives actually a possibility to uh, progress. Um, the work uh, other than during the meetings uh, that happen uh, uh, from time to time, three or four times uh, a year, uh, depending on the year. Um, now, uh, um, these ATO groups, uh, uh, the majority of their activities are through email reflectors. So often when we say an ATO group, it means there is a chair, maybe more than one chair, uh, and a number of members, but basically they, uh, they um, they, they are put all in an email reflector and a lot of discussions uh, takes place through through email and uh, now the good news is that although uh, at, uh, access to documents or attendance of the MPEG and JPEG meetings are not uh, possible for non-accredited experts, uh, 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 both JPEG and MPEG allow actually with different process but very similar uh, in many cases, uh, for people to join email uh, reflectors, uh, so you don't need to be accredited by a national body to actually join a reflector. Um, uh, of course, uh, this is the majority of cases, but sometimes other groups, uh, because of the importance of the work they have to do and because it is required sometimes uh, in order to really progress uh, uh, with the deliverables and the mandates and objective, they can actually have also face-to-face -face meetings. So these are not meetings where decisions are made. These are meetings where people meet. They uh, they, they they work towards something, and uh, once uh, the, the the preferred um, topics that have to be decided, and uh, then the decision, of course, are made when the working groups are meeting. Um, uh, in order for you to know um, what are the other groups, because the they appear and disappear, of course. Some of them, they get conducted uh, again after the meeting is over. Uh, in order for, for you to know that, always uh, after every JPEG or MPEG meeting, there is a list of ATO groups uh, that, is, uh, that is established. Uh, and beyond just having the list, it, it, it says in details what are the objectives, what are the mandates, who are the chairs, how to join, and if there are any meetings, when they take place. And that information, by the way, is public. Now, another thing that uh, that also is important to say at this point is uh, the issue of intellectual property. Uh, now, the question really has always been: Okay, we, you know, standards are great, uh, but uh, and we want to have them as open as possible. But what about intellectual property? Because you know, the minimum is that if somebody writes uh, some spec, even if there is nothing else. Uh, the, 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 the copyright the, uh, of, of that uh, text uh, should belong somewhere. Often, you actually give the copyright to the uh, uh, to ISO. So basically, if you contribute to a standard, you immediately give uh, the copyright to ISO. So ISO can basically do whatever it wants uh, with that text. Uh, other than that, um, uh, uh, for everything that has to do with patents and intellectual property, other than the copyright, uh, um, of course, um, the main uh, preference is uh, to have uh, the specs as widely accessible as possible, and in fact, really as widely as possible. But access doesn't mean that uh, people should not pay fees, for instance, uh, for licensing a technology or 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 uh, or paying some fees in in order to use a technology that can be, for instance, uh, protected by 
pattern, right? So, so, so in fact, ISO, and of course, because MPEG and JPEG are often under ISO IEC, and also ITUT through the mechanism I told you, they have actually uh, some uh, some set of uh, rules that are established in the sense that it, the preference is usually given to specification that are uh, that are either patent free which means they don't have a patent or if they have a patent that's fine too as long as they are royalty free and license free now if this is not possible because you know some people you know they they they, they have spent and uh, uh, spend effort, money, and time on that. Uh, then, uh, the, uh, the, the, if there is any licensing, it should be reasonable and non-discriminatory. This means that nobody uh, who owns a, 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 an intellectual property under a specification, under JPEG or MPEG, can actually uh, exclude, for instance, their competitors. Either they have to say, hey, we have a patent in this, you shouldn't use it at all, or if they allow it, then they have to have a um, reasonable and non-discriminatory term. Non-discriminatory means that they cannot exclude uh, a priori groups, and it has to be reasonable, meaning that they cannot, for instance, say for our competitors, is 100 times more licensing fee and royalty fee than for others. You know, they have to be kind of similar. Uh, of course, all these things have been established on something called common patent policy uh, between all these organizations, uh, and this is really basically the code of practice. Let me tell you very, very quickly uh, what actually this common, uh, common patent policy really um, means. Uh, of course, um, these uh, standardization bodies, they know very well that uh, uh, people who attend and develop the specs uh, on such technical uh, working groups, they are not necessarily familiar with lots of complex issues that are relevant to intellectual property and patent laws that change even from country to, to, from, to country. So they have actually simplified that and they made it very, very simple. In fact, there is a form every time uh, a spec is created, uh, uh, those who believe that they, they have maybe some intellectual property and that they have to basically answer uh, by, by, by checking one of the three cases that is on this slide. So either they say, hey, this is license free of charge, which is great. Then this, is, uh, this means that basically everything can be used. Nobody needs to ask nobody anything. There is a case too, which actually happens a little bit more often, is that it is licensing based, but it should be reasonable and non-discriminatory because of the uh, as guidelines that I mentioned to you. And there is, of course, a, a third one, which is none of the above, which means that often uh, the solution is that uh, those experts who have created that spec, they have to go back and redesign and make sure that uh, a given technology for which the owners of that technology are not willing to either give it as uh, free or uh, based on a reasonable and non-discriminatory term uh, uh, are not actually, you don't use their technology. Uh, now, um, uh, of course, um, there are always exceptions, and uh, um, and also these things have are very very generic. So, uh, in the case of the standards that SC29 does, uh, of course, these these rules have to be followed. But uh, uh, SC29 has actually established its own IPR guidance. Uh, now, guidelines means that um, it is not basically uh, changing or uh, uh, seeing differently from the guidelines of its higher bodies, but it is actually uh, recommending a, a good course of action in order to do that. And in this case, uh, uh, SC29 actually uh, uh, says that uh, one has to consider for inclusion uh, in a standard um, technology that is either free in terms of IP, as I mentioned, or available to all implementers, uh, 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 either on a RAND, random and non uh, uh, reasonable non discriminatory condition, or uh, not a RAND. Now, there are sometimes, and 
it has never happened, as far as I know, in S29. There are exceptions where uh, sometimes one can go back and do things. This is this is not something that is really SU29 uh, relevant only, but there has been cases that there are provisions uh, sometimes uh, where uh, there are, of course, uh, cases where one can standardize something, uh, but this has to go, uh, which doesn't fulfill these these conditions, but one has to go under uh, ISO Council, which is a council like a bunch of wise guys who are sitting there and they're making uh, decisions. Now, another thing that is extremely important is that SC29, and of course in general ISO, and IEC and ITUT, they have actually explicitly forbidden that the working groups uh, uh, have discussions uh, in terms of negotiations regarding specific licensing terms and conditions uh, of uh, their, uh, their standards. That's very, very important. What does it mean really practically? It means that when you specify something, you only need to answer whether there is yes or no a, a license or a royalty and if yes, whether it is uh, RAND, reasonable non discriminatory or not. And you just send that information as experts in a working group like MPEG or JPEG to um, ISO uh, and IEC and ITU and you do not go any uh, step beyond that. So you don't try to find out whether this is true or not. You don't want to find out uh, whether it is really um, the case or not. You don't want to start saying, oh, yeah, so let's see what if I do this, uh, is this still relevant or or things like that. Uh, so this, these discussions cannot take place. They have to take place outside of SC29 standards, in fact, even outside ISO uh, uh, and IEC and ITUT. Uh, of course, uh, JPEG and MPEG under S29, they also have their own type of guidelines and the way they implement. Uh, roughly speaking, uh, JPEG usually gives stronger preference to royalty-free, license-free free, um, approaches. So, uh, in fact, if you look, uh, most JPEG standards, if not all, uh, what is called baseline, uh, which is basically the, 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 the spec that comes first, is uh, uh, defined in such a way that there are no royalties, uh, or if they are uh, royalties, they are royalty free. Uh, basically, you pay zero. And of course, if you extend these things, uh, or you want to enhance them, this is possible to have uh, maybe some uh, reasonable and non-discriminatory uh, uh, extensions uh, uh, based on the uh, baseline that is usually foreseen for the majority of the applications. Now, MPEG does it the other way around. MPEG usually uh, uh, actually is happy with having grant uh, meaning that its baseline, its first, uh, you know, the most widely uh, used spec uh, of a given uh, technology is actually usually RAND, and then uh, it, uh, uh, it, it can be, of course, uh, extensions to it, and they will be, of course, also RAND because of the guidelines. Uh, with the exception that very recently uh, MPEG uh, has started, actually, to, to also look a little bit at things that, uh, that uh, JPEG has been looking at, uh, that's because, you know, mm, uh, JPEG has been very, very successful. A number of its standards have been license-free, free, relative free, and the reason for which they have been so successful has been this. Also, MPEG sees now a lot of royalty-free, free, license-free, free competition by other, uh, either proprietary or, or other organization committees, and because of that, it is exploring and uh, it is actually in the process of also standardizing a number of license-free, free, royalty-free free specifications. But this is a, something that is now ongoing. Uh, now, uh, another thing that is probably worth mentioning at this point is uh, that uh, standards don't happen in one shot. 
usually there are a number of iterations that happen. Often, uh, you start at the preliminary stage uh, with a preliminary working draft, which is basically uh, the idea of making you know some standard because you need uh, something new happens and. Uh, you need a standard, for instance, for a new file format or for a new audio format or for you a video format. And uh, so you start basically exploring that. And this is usually referred to as preliminary work item until the point where you are kind of uh, certain through uh, feedback you receive from experts from different national bodies that, in fact, it is really uh, necessary to have a um, standard. Now, once you do this, you move to another uh, phase, which is called uh, proposal stage, in which you actually require, you, you ask uh, national bodies to give their opinion about creation of a new work at item proposal for a given standard. And then uh, 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 if the answer is positive, uh, then you start, uh, in fact, something called a preparatory stage which is uh, coming up with different working drafts. Usually these working drafts uh, you know, pr are preceded by a number of uh, proposals uh, coming from various um, uh, companies and universities. And then they, you know, through a process, a very first uh, um, draft of, the, of, the, uh, of what will become the potential standard starts. And uh, this goes through a number of iterations. Uh, and uh, after every iteration, you create, when you get some uh, uh, maturity, uh, into something called committee draft. Now, a committee draft is very close to the final standard. And at that uh, level, you actually start having um, queries to national bodies to vote for it. And uh, there are a number of actually uh, iterations there also until uh, the standard is approved. And once it is approved, of course, then you need to publish it, and uh, you know uh, people can buy it, or or sometimes uh, in some cases they can they can download it for free from uh, either ISO, IEC, uh, or uh, JTC1 or ITUT uh, if it is jointly developed by ITUT. Uh, uh, servers and uh, and databases. Now, I, I want to spend the rest actually of the um, of of my talk um, on uh, giving you a little bit more concrete uh, examples of a number of uh, JPEG standards uh, in the past and where it is going. And I do the same very briefly also for MPEG. Uh, keeping in mind that I'm hoping that also Alexander Rocky will, will probably cover some of the things I won't cover. Uh, so, of course, in JPEG committee, I don't need even to tell you this, uh, JPEG uh, has been extremely successful in uh, uh, creating a format that is basically now almost synonymous to, uh, to what is what people call an image, right? Sometimes people, instead of saying, I have a digital uh, version of an image. They say I have a JPEG. Uh, that is actually referring to the first uh, standard that JPEG committee created uh, some 25 years ago. It's actually a little bit now over 25 years ago. And uh, it is actually very, very successful. Here in this graphic, I'm showing you how actually only in the five uh, popular um, apps that are around, uh, how the number of images have increased year after year uh, per year. And in fact, if you look, as of May 2014, only in these five uh, 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 applications and services, you have nearly 2 billion images that are being created and shared in JPEG. Now, um, if you uh, look at the, uh, the growth, uh, there are no statistics for 2015 that have been provided, but you could imagine that in 2015, this must be, again, another doubling. So we must be not that far uh, from 4 billion. And this is only these five, uh, of course, apps. You could imagine if you add a few others uh, that are also very popular, there are tens of billions of images in JPEG that are being created every day. And this shows actually how great of an ecosystem this is. There are almost as many images that get created per day than there are people on Earth. And of course, not every one of them creates them, but 
it's 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 by itself it's very very impressive and at the same time the growth that doesn't seem to stop is showing also that it is it is um, it is it is it is probably the most popular in fact uh, standard that has ever been created. Now uh, JPEG uh, did not stop there. Uh, in fact, continued working and in year 2000, so some 15 years ago, in fact, created another standard called JPEG 2000, which is uh, not that popular for um, uh, consumer applications, uh, but in fact, in a lot of professional markets, has become extremely important. Uh, JPEG 2000 is actually the format that is used in digital cinema, for instance, if you go to cinema. And uh, nowadays, almost all movie theaters are digital. The format that is used there uh, to display the images and, uh, is, is JPEG 2000. Um, a, a lot of aerial imaging uh, databases, uh, they actually uh, keep their data in, uh, in JPEG 2000. DICOM, which standardizes uh, digital images for uh, medical applications, uh, is also using JPEG 2000, so a lot of actually medical images. When you go get an X-ray or or MRI, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, they are actually stored in JPEG 2000. Um, in um, in archival, actually, it's also a lot used, and increasingly, and in fact, this has become now the largest success of JPEG 2000. Also for studio applications, uh, the the videos, the the movies, are actually in JPEG 2000. So if you have a live event, for instance, uh, in some stadium, and you have a, a few cameras uh, connected to a truck, and then maybe through some satellite or other links, this is connected to, to the studio, where then it gets broadcast until the studio, everything is JPEG 2000. Within the studio also, it's in JPEG 2000, but once you want to broadcast it to people, to their TVs, then it is converted to MPEG-2 or MPEG-4, or uh, et cetera, et cetera. Now, another maybe less known uh, um, uh, 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 specification that was created by JPEG committee is JPEG XR. XR uh, stands for extended range for things like high dynamic range. Now, uh, the reason was very simple. The reason was that JPEG, which is, of course, extremely popular, um, is relatively simple, uh, but in terms of compression efficiency, also it's kind of, it's okay, but uh, you know, it's uh, for the state of the art, uh, it's not doing, uh, you know, um, the maximum of what one would expect. Uh, on the other hand, you have JPEG 2000. JPEG 2000 is far more complex. Of course, it's more also in terms of compression efficiency, it's much better. And uh, in fact, JPEG committee uh, looked at this situation at some point uh, after year 2000, after JPEG 2000 was standardized, and saw that there is actually a gap there. Uh, people, like camera manufacturers, for instance, they were not ready to move from JPEG to JPEG 2000 because JPEG 2000 was very, very complex. And it wasn't only the complexity, also the power drain and all these things were, 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 were um, very important. And uh, because of that, uh, there was a, 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 a new project that was created called JPEG XR, which was, by the way, uh, uh, basically inspired from a format that Microsoft had created called HD Photo, which basically you have in, if you use a Windows machine, you must have it uh, by default on your, on your machine. So this is referred to as JPEG XR. Uh, in fact, JPEG XR is a little bit uh, different from HD Photo because, in fact, it is better than uh, than uh, than HD Photo, but it is uh, very very close to it. And uh, this is uh, this uh, this is where it actually situates. So it is not as complex as JPEG 2000. It is a little bit more complex than JPEG, and of course, in terms of performance, it sits in between. Now, in, in fact, interestingly, JPEG XR is in many, many products. In many, many products, uh, this is just a list of some of them. Many of them, of course, are owned by Microsoft, but not only. Many, many others are not. But in, although it is in many, many products, it is not used uh, as, as uh, much as it should be. Uh, most people don't even know that it exists. And uh, this is a good uh, question. Uh, to ask ourselves, right? Why is this the case? I'm going to get back to this a little bit later. 
But let me, uh, before that, uh, tell you a little bit about another actually aspect of standardization that JP Committee does, and this is JP Search. Now, JP Search is actually a standard that uh, came out about the uh, year 2007. So it's been actually around for already quite uh, some time. And it has to do with how you actually annotate, manage, and and uh, and uh, um, order, put in order uh, images. Now, many of you um, have uh, taken a lot of pictures, uh, and we often have thousands of pictures either on our uh, devices, like laptops, or even on our mobile phones. It would be nice if we could actually have a set of metadata and additional information uh, that can be can be standardized, and in fact, this is what JP Search does. And what is nice about JP Search is that JP Search basically is the format of the metadata that you could embed within a JPEG file or a JPEG 2000 file. Uh, but of course, um, this is the past, and um, JPEG uh, has been now looking into a number of additional, actually, avenues uh, for uh, still imaging and moving imaging even uh, uh, standardization activities where uh, th there is a need to, to, to have them. Uh, let me uh, quickly tell you what they are, and then we can see a little bit into more details what, uh, uh, more about them. One of them is called advanced image coding. So, you know, uh, uh, image compression, uh, of course, continues. Uh, people come up with new ways of compressing images. Uh, JPEG, uh, although very popular, is based on technologies that are at least 30 years old. We know that JPEG 2000 is based on technologies that are about 20 years old. It has been standard 15 years ago. And uh, so there is, you know, uh, it's natural to think that probably uh, there will be uh, soon, if not already, an opportunity to standardize some new technology for image compression that will be better in terms of compression efficiency or some other efficiencies than, uh, than both uh, JPEG and uh, JPEG 2000 or even JPEG itself. Now, this is, of course, the goal of the, uh, advanced image coding, but the very first thing that uh, 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 JPEG committee does is uh, first to come up with evaluation methodologies and metrics. So this is, you know, in order to be able to do that, you need first to understand, like, how to evaluate uh, performance. What does it mean? And come up with metrics for that. There are a number of others. JPEG also has nowadays an activity on augmented reality because augmented reality is a hot topic, and of course, images uh, are used in augmented reality. Uh, and increasingly, because uh, things are becoming more and more complex in systems, uh, in multimedia systems, you need actually a systems aspect uh, uh, for, for JPEG. So this is another thing that is happening. And last but not least, it's uh, the JPEG XT. So JPEG XT actually is almost a finished uh, standardization, and it refers to uh, a JPEG backward, forward compatible high dynamic range compression. And I want to tell you a little bit more about 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 this. Uh, so what does it mean? Uh, so we know that almost every mobile phone nowadays have what is called a high dynamic range mode in it, which basically when mm, things get saturated or when things are too dark, it uh, tries to manage in order to create something that has a high dynamic range. So we know that this is, this is great, it exists. But often, the information that is, that is produced after this processing to make things either captured uh, in high dynamic range by some processing, rendering some, uh, or, or some sensed, uh, images into high dynamic range, often, because there is no format for it um, that is widely used, it is stored by actually destroying some information, again, into JPEG. Uh, and the reason is because JPEG is the most uh, 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 widely used uh, standard for that. Of course, uh, one could use JPEG 2000, but as I told you, people don't like to use JPEG 2000 because they find it is very complex although it, is, it can deal uh, with high dynamic range content. They don't want to use JPEG XR because it is there and it is in products. People are not using it. So the question is why? Why did, didn't people use, why don't people want to use JPEG or uh, JPEG XR or JPEG um, 2000, but they still prefer to use JPEG, the, the, the legacy JPEG? 
But the reason is very simple. The reason is because there is a huge mm. ecosystem that already exists. Almost any mm. hardware or software um, device you take, uh, it has a JPEG encoder decoded in it. So if you create something in JPEG, it can be consumed. It can be understood by these devices. That's, that's the main reason that JPEG 2000 couldn't replace JPEG. That's the main reason why JPEG XR, XR did not replace JPEG for high dynamic page. So JPEG committee decided, it, so then maybe their solution is to make a file format that will be, that can contain high dynamic range images, but if you have an old JPEG decoder, you could still see a JPEG image, but this time it won't be high dynamic range. It will be just, you know, a low dynamic range as if you had uh, converted it into a low dynamic range. And that's really the promise of JPEG XT. The JPEG XT, in fact, relies on a mechanism that exists since the beginning uh, when the JPEG was uh, created, and this is called app marker. App markers are special start codes that actually allow you to, to insert additional information. And in fact, once you know this, then it's very simple. You can create from a JPEG uh, 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 file a portion that will be just JPEG, uh, and then, uh, but it will be low dynamic range, and the high dynamic range will be actually uh, created by making a predictive coding and putting the residual part inside this app marker. What does it mean then? It means that if you have an old decoder, the, decoder, the old decoder is going to skip over the app marker because it doesn't even understand it, but it's going to be able to decode still a JPEG image uh, that is low dynamic range. And for decoders that are understanding this um, app marker and what is uh, put as information, then you could actually uh, use that and, uh, and, and decode up to a uh, uh, um, high dynamic image. This is more or less the design principle of the of the of the of the JPEG XT. So here on the top, basically, you see the uh, the part which is just a legacy JPEG decoder. So once you have an image, you basically uh, cut it into two parts. One part is going to be what is on the top, which is we refer to as low dynamic range, and this is going to be just a JPEG decoder in this case, right? And then there is an additional part that you see here in the in the in the lower uh, branch, which is basically the residual uh, part. Now, interestingly, everything has been done not only in such a way that the uh, the base line is the LDR part is using a JPEG decoder or encoder. Even the extension part is using a JPEG encoder decoder. So, in fact. A JPEG XT, roughly speaking, is two JPEG encoders or two JPEG decoders, if you want to encode or decode, which is great. Uh, it, at the same time, allows you to use the same hardware, which makes it very, very attractive. You could actually show that this gives you actually very, very um, great uh, results. In fact, um, very close to the performance of uh, JPEG XT at times, sometimes it is even better than JPEG XT, uh, sorry, JPEG XR, uh, and it can get as quite close uh, in a fair way to JPEG 2000. Of course, it's not as efficient in terms of compression efficiency as JPEG 2000, but it is close enough uh, for many practical applications. And in terms of overhead, actually, it is not a lot of overhead, depending on what you are looking for in terms of quality, the overhead uh, is between 10 and 50 percent. So in fact, uh, basically half of the file in JPEG XT is, is or to up to 90 percent, is the low dynamic range part, and then the remainder is the, the high dynamic range. So you, this gives you an idea about what is the price to pay in order to be able to store still a high dynamic range image. Of course, uh, another thing that JPEG is looking at these days is JPEG privacy and security, because privacy is becoming very, very important. And there also, JPEG is looking into how to actually have mechanisms in order to secure, uh, uh, especially for privacy purposes, 
uh, JPEG files, the original JPEG files. Here also, it actually uses uh, the same mechanism as app markers. So you could actually uh, protect, for instance, uh, some parts of your image and, in fact, hide them in, uh, after, for instance, uh, encryption inside these app markers. So the mechanism is actually very, very similar to the mechanism of JPEG XD, uh, whereas here it is done for different uh, reasons. Now, much more recently, and this is now, I would say, 18 months uh, old, uh, JPEG has been also looking into um, other extensions. When this time, uh, the extension towards uh, uh, things that are more volumetric. Now, um, um, there is a JPEG uh, um, project that has just been started. Uh, so it is actually at this preliminary phase that I mentioned to you. It is not yet new work item, it is being explored. Um, it is referred to as JPEG Pleno. Now, JPEG Pleno, Pleno actually means something planoptic. And it could be either represented as light field uh, or point clouds or holographic even. Now, we know that actually nowadays a number of uh, cameras uh, exist, you can go and buy, that are based on light field, uh, point cloud with LiDAR, etc. you can capture. And holography, although it's not there, a lot of holographic microscopy application exists. Now, you cannot display them necessarily in holography, but at least you have to capture and store these things in, in, a, in, in, a, in a format that is understood by all. And this is exactly what JPEG Pleno is, uh, is, is trying to do. Now, JPEG Pleno basically this time doesn't want to look at an image as a, a two-dimensional uh, content, but as actually a seven-dimensional content. Now, there are many, many ways, and I don't want to go into the details of it, but there are many, many ways you can do that. Uh, now, depending on whether you use geometry or not, explicitly you can start uh, from representation, like light field, all the way to, uh, to, uh, to view-dependent textures, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, going through some some uh, uh, some some uh, some, uh, um, some some alternative methods uh, that are in between, and uh, uh, this is really what uh, JPEG uh, Pleno actually is planning to do. Now, um, of course, JPEG Pleno is a, a work that has just been started, so there isn't much I can tell you about it, other than uh, it is it has started. There is a lot of interest into it. Uh, but uh, what it really wants to do is not to have for every one of these uh, uh, representations, I told you, a, a different uh, representation, a different coding method. It wants to actually combine them and actually even ideally have only one representation model that can cope with all of them. If it cannot be all, a very limited number of them. It has to be um, also uh, something that probably will be extended. Uh, so maybe in the beginning it will be more omnidirectional images, etc. Then it will go to point cloud, light field, and maybe ultimately holography. No, not all of it has to be uh, available from the uh, from the beginning. And eventually also it will be also like JPEG XD backward compatible for the same reason JPEG XD is backward compatible with JPEG. Um, uh, this means that uh, a, a future planoptic image, if you have a, a, a stored in a file, if you have a very old JPEG decoder, you click on it, it gives you at least an image. Now, it won't be plain optic, it won't be 3D, but it will be like a flat, good old JPEG image. And that is very, very important, as I told you, for the ecosystem that is in place because nobody seems to like to actually get rid of and abandon the current uh, ecosystem. Uh, last uh, point uh, I want to tell you is about uh, the Lightwelt uh, low latency image coding, which is actually something that JPEG uh, started recently. Now, uh, until now, the, most of the activities in both MPEG and JPEG were about, okay, how can you make things more complex and get more compression? But actually, there are some cases where you don't need actually that much compression. And in that case, you are actually looking for more of a very low complexity and, uh, uh, and especially low latency image coding. Uh, you could think about um, applications where, for instance, you are playing a game on your mobile phone and it's uh, 
being displayed uh, on, a, on a large screen or you have actually goggles like these VR and AR glasses and uh, you, you basically see them from your from some server which is sitting on your uh, on on uh, in your room uh, in these cases within your room or between the the the, the server and this uh, device that visualizes display or even a head mounted display the bandwidth actually is pretty high but um, but still not high enough to to send everything in raw there you are looking for compression ratios that are between 4 and 6 so even you know it's even lower than what jpeg does uh, pretty well, but of course you don't want to be as uh, complex as even JPEG. You want to be even less complex than JPEG, and especially you want to be very, very low delay. And the reason for this is that because in many of these applications you cannot even uh, wait one frame in order before displaying it. You have to not so not only it shouldn't be motion compensated. Probably it should not even uh, require. Uh, more than just a very limited number of lines before uh, the decoding can, can, can take place. Let me finish, uh, as I told you, because also we, we will soon run out of time, uh, by uh, giving you a few things about uh, what are actually activities that are happening also in terms of video coding. Now this chart actually showing you a little bit the activities on one hand of IQT and on the other hand of ISO inside MPEG uh, in terms of standardization. In fact, it all started in 1984 with a ITUT standard called H120, which is basically not really that used. The first really successful uh, video coding standard was used for video telephony, uh, for telephone conferencing on over ISDNs, H261. That was in 1988. Shortly after that, in 1993, um, uh, MPEG-1 was created. So MPEG-1 actually uh, was created by by uh, by uh, by MPEG committee with some uh, good success, and a uh, little bit later on MPEG-2 with very 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 huge success was also created by MPEG. It was so successful that ITU actually decided it wants to rubber stamp and actually call it. So it's exactly the same, just call it after fact H262. But uh, uh, ITU started to actually improve H261 by uh, creating a series of uh, video telephony standards called H263, H263+, and H263++. And on, on the other hand, MPEG improved MPEG-2 by creating something called MPEG-4. Now, uh, up to around year 2000, as you can see, things were a little bit uh, messy. On one hand, uh, ITU was creating things, on the other hand, MPEG was creating things, and then, you know, they were each, uh, uh, of course, getting inspired by each other in terms of technology, but there was no collaboration. In uh, year 2000, activities started in order to uh, uh, jointly develop standards. And in fact, this is where you see all these blue uh, uh, um, uh, bullets that follow each other, so H264, which on the on the uh, on the side of MPEG is called ABC. In fact, was jointly developed through this joint activity that I that I showed you in the chart that I showed you before, and then it was actually extended. It became SVC, which is a scalable version of it and a multi-view version of it, and the same thing, of course, here, and most much more recently than uh, HEVC, which uh, which uh, which is of course the name that is jointly used uh, by both uh, MPEG and uh, ITUT. Of course, this has, uh, through uh, the last, let's say, 20 years, has, in fact, increased a lot the compression efficiency. In fact, if you look at the different generations, you see that, more or less uh, speaking, every five years or so, you more or less divide by two the required bit rate that is needed to code something with the previous generation, which is great news. But of course, this work is still continuing. So in fact, MPEG is looking at the extensions of HEVC, the very latest standard that has created. Some of them are jointly with, uh, with, um, uh, with ITU. Um, uh, uh, so the ones that are with ITU, I, I, I show you here. So this is again uh, here, the same chart. On one si side, you have ITU. The other side, you have MPEG. You see that, again, we start with H261 and MPEG-1 on one hand, then MPEG-2 
uh, two was just done jointly then uh, on ITU site uh, H264 uh, three was done and big four was done then H264 was joined was done jointly which basically is called HEBC after that which is was again was done jointly and currently there are actually three versions of the standard that are kind of finished they are also joint one of them is called scalable HEBC one of them is called uh, multi-view HEVC and one of them is called 3D HEVC. The differences uh, are probably technical. I, I'm not going to tell you much uh, about them uh, right now, but just know that the scalable HEVC allows you to have uh, decoding of either lower uh, frame rate or lower quality or lower um, uh, uh, resolution of a, of a video that can be of higher resolution and stored in a file. Uh, very, very recently, MPEG has been looking also uh, on 3D, but a little bit differently. Um, this is called uh, Freeview TV. Now, the Freeview TV actually is very simple. Um, we know that um, standards like HEVC are foreseen to be used for very high resolution, like 4K or 8K ultra high definition TVs. The problem is that Although this increases the sense of immersion, you cannot change your viewpoint, which is something you can do in reality. Of course, MPEG uh, has uh, standards for uh, multi-view uh, HEVC, but the problem is that uh, multi-view HEVC really does not make it easy to create uh, more views that you have at your disposition. So if you had three cameras or four cameras, that was giving you four views, you can really do four cameras. You could do more, but it's by post-processing and it's not very nice. Um, 3DVC uh, tried to resolve that to facilitate actually creation of more than uh, the number of views that the cameras have captured, but it is only possible if it is only horizontal and only a limited number of additional views. So that's why actually, uh, because super multi-view uh, which means basically as many uh, views as you want is uh, really appearing, especially in the displays. Uh, there is probably a need for a format that uh, can um, cope with this kind of uh, 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 new technologies. And that's why, in fact, MPEG is currently looking at something called super multi-view. You could think of it of a multi-view uh, that is uh, that is uh, that allows you to to not only go left and right with many many views but also in the other direction even vertically and uh, at the same time it is also looking at uh, situations where for instance you can look at a scene from any um, a, a point of view uh, let's say um, a, a, a sport event and you want to look actually at the at the football match for instance that is taking place from any point of view. So these are this the second one is called free navigation. The previous one is called super multi view and currently MPEG is actually looking at um, coming up with a with a with a standard in order to be able to cope with these kind of situations. So I uh, hope that this was not very very quick but uh, hopefully it was uh, 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 enough uh, for you to actually um, understand where uh, both MPEG and JPEG committees uh, activities in terms of standardization were, where uh, it is heading. Now, let me just conclude by giving you a, 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 a few um, a, a conclusion remarks and then we can discuss more. Uh, first of all, a, a one thing that has actually become very, very clear is that with this new type of modalities like the super multi-view or the high dynamic range or the um, uh, uh, planoptic uh, imaging, uh, there is really a need in order to better understand how subjectively and even better if possible, objectively the quality has to be assessed uh, to um, in order to be able to make choices, right? PSNR was uh, working quite well for um, for conventional imaging, although it had limitations. But currently, when you talk about 3D, high dynamic range, or immersive content, 
uh, like those you can get from uh, Super Multiview or JP Pleno, uh, or, uh, PSNR doesn't mean anything. So you have to really come up with uh, new ways to, to, to evaluating these. Not only necessarily as, a, as, a, as an algorithm, but also even how to evaluate immersiveness, even subjectively. These are, these are open points. And really, the progress of both JPEG and MPEG standards are very much pending. In fact, availability of very good and reliable subjective and objective metrics for, for doing these things. Uh, I, uh, I would like to actually uh, 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 confirm here something that probably you, you, uh, you had in mind, uh, that in fact, in terms of standardization, really the trend in the next few years is on high dynamic range 3D and immersive content. So this is really where the majority of the work in the next few years is going to happen in, in both JPEG and MPEG. But let's not forget that low complexity and low latency coding, which is extremely important also. There are a growing number of uh, applications that require actually very low complexity and especially low latency with not much compression efficiency and of course transparent uh, quality in terms of quality. And even there, you need uh, new methodologies in order to evaluate the quality of something that is transparent. Think about it, it's not as obvious. Although if you look at uh, JPEG AIC, there has been some solutions that have been even standardized recently based on that. Okay, so maybe I will, I will stop here. And I think that we should be kind of okay with time now, right? So we can ask, uh, if you have some questions, you could ask by writing it on the... So if there is any question, write it in the, in the window, in the chat window. So, I see multiple people are writing something, so let's see what will come out. I'm still waiting for the very first question. In the meantime, I would like to take the opportunity to thank you for starting the series of OSCs in QOVNet with such uh, great presentations. And now I see we have both comments and questions here. Okay, so we have one question. The question says, is JP search algorithm used in Google image search? No. The answer is very clear. Google is currently number one. Why should they use a standardized technology in order to share uh, the result of their uh, search with others? So in fact, I don't, uh, of course, you know, when you are number one, you don't want to share. So. I don't think that Google uh, will be the best candidate for that. But if you are number 10, number 12, and between number 10 and number 100, all these companies, if they join forces and use something like JP Search, they can, right, win. So this is, this is starting to appear. In fact, a lot of um, uh, uh, annotation, even by taking photos and things like that, uh, with your with your mobile phone are, are appearing and they there is a potential at least uh, they have uh, they have been involved in, in some of them at least in uh, in in JP committee and they are potential users of this standard but not the big ones I don't expect that Google will be doing it uh, because it's not in their interest. So we have a second question that says, I wonder if JPEG can be used in biomedical imaging, as JPEG is lossy compression technique 
and they can be yes actually yes absolutely so jpeg if you are meaning by jpeg the the legacy jpeg the first jpeg and the most widely used jpeg algorithm that is around the answer is jpeg is not and used for medical image but jpeg 2000 is because jpeg 2000 actually allows you to compress losslessly in fact, you could take a, any region and code it in lossless way or um, or even the whole image in lossless way, up to lossless, let's call it. So uh, you could you could still, for purpose of visualization, fast visualization, decode just part of the image you can see, but if you want to do diagnosis, you, you actually decode it in a lossless way. That's why JPEG 2000 is used in DICOM. In fact, it's, it's uh, very widely used in DICOM, but uh, JPEG is not. Uh, although DICOM had, uh, in as an option, JPEG in the past, no doctor used it because that's, uh, if there is uh, a misdiagnosis, uh, they will be trouble, right? Because uh, the, if the diagnosis was, uh, was, uh, was wrong because of the compression uh, artifacts, then that's not good, right? So we have another question. I would like to find out about objective assessment. Do JPEG and MPEG groups improve or take into account new objective mechanisms? What are their quality assessment? Okay, so this is a very very generic question. Let me uh, let me let me tell you, for instance, for JPEG and for MPEG. Also, I will I will tell you something after that. So uh, uh, AIC, Advanced Image Coding. Um, is a standard uh, that is actually being now uh, set up and uh, in fact uh, it's part one is already standardized and in part one in fact it it tells you how to evaluate subjectively or objectively uh, quality so in fact it doesn't it is, you know uh, standardization committees do not invent new things they standardize things so in fact the part one of AIC has a number of um, objective and subjective assessment technologies. So, as you could imagine, uh, the objective uh, metrics uh, for conventional content uh, is around 80 to 90 percent uh, uh, correlation with subjective assessment. Um, and currently, what JPEG is doing, it is looking at extending that um, that uh, that specification by adding metrics for um, a high dynamic range. So for high dynamic range, it is known that PSNR does a very, very poor job and it cannot be used at all. So you cannot optimize things or evaluate things by just using PSNR if the content is HDR. So that's what JPEG has been doing. So JPEG basically has used actually a number of assessment methodologies to standardize its uh, it's uh, JPEG XT technology and also JPEG XR technology because both use HDR and now it is standardizing some of them under AIC. Um, it is also looking into standardization of quality assessment, both subjective and objective, for things like plan optic image uh, 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 representation because if you want to know how well uh, algorithm A does versus algorithm B for presentable content, you have to have a metric. And PSNR is not a good one again there, and uh, so this is something that is ongoing. Same more or less with MPEG. So MPEG, MPEG is not standardizing uh, anything in terms of uh, sub, uh, uh, subjective or objective uh, metrics, but in fact it is using a lot of uh, subject and, uh, and objective metrics for evaluation of its um, uh, technologies. In fact, we are uh, ourselves very, very involved in that. Um, the latest activities around uh, high dynamic range that MPEG uh, has been doing, continues doing, is actually um, using some subjective metrics and some objective metrics that, among others, my team here at EPFL developed. Uh, same for 3D. In fact, the the, uh, the, the 3D HEVC and the MVC uh, 
uh, HEBC, uh, uh, MB HEBC, sorry, uh, they are actually, they were uh, subjectively uh, evaluated by my lab. Uh, this is how, in fact, the, pro the standard progress, and we even uh, suggested a number of objective metrics uh, that can be used. So this is ongoing. Uh, MPEG is not standardizing anything in terms of objective or subjective evaluations. It only uses them in order to progress. A JPEG is standardizing some of them. So. OK, so uh, let's see if there is any other question. So I don't see any other question. Last chance. OK, somebody is writing. Let's see if this is a question. I think it's all right. So is any objective quality metric currently used for comparing proposals of 3D HEVC standardization? Objective metrics, uh, no. In fact, uh, so, so the 3D HEVC standardization, this is already finished. And uh, normally, uh, you don't want to rely on objective metrics for that. So in fact, every time there, is a, there are proposals, because you know that subjective evaluation is the ground truth, you always do uh, subjective evaluations. Objective metrics come later. If you want to optimize things, you want to do rate distortions and things like that. So, so the answer to this question is no. Uh, there are no objective metrics that was that are currently used to compare potential for 3D HEVC because actually 3D HEVC is finished. So it is already standard. Uh, so subjective evaluation were used for that. But there are some people, including us, but many many other teams around the world, they have been looking at objective metrics that can mimic uh, quite well this, because you cannot every time you want to optimize an encoder, go and do subject evaluation. Actually, sometimes it's impossible even, right? Because it has to be done in real time. So we have another one. ITUT has started a group on audio video quality assessment. Does JPEG even have a special group specified? No. So, um, uh, so that's a very good uh, question. So uh, of course, ITUT has uh, a study group that is around audio video quality assessment, they don't have for image. So that's why JPEG is standardizing image quality assessment. But MPEG doesn't. And the reason it doesn't is exactly the reason you said. Because ITUT already has a group that does both for audio and for video. So, you know, uh, the work is being done there. So there is no reason to. Um, to uh, to do it. Um, so we have another question. Is there any study regarding impact of compression ratio on user experience? Oh, absolutely. So that's that's basically almost every uh, other uh, paper that is written on uh, user experience or quality of experience takes into account, among other things, impact of compression. Yes. There are many, so I I, uh, I I cannot really pinpoint one specific one, but this is a major, actually, uh, parameter people use when they want to understand and predict, either measure subjectively or subj objectively quality of experience. Yes. Is there, is it the interest of over the top? OK. Uh, I'm not sure I understood the question. Is it the interest of OTTs? What does it mean? So the person who asked the question about uh, OTT should should clarify what they mean. I suppose this is over the top, like Netflix, but I don't know what you mean. Um. 
So I'm waiting for the answer and then okay. The study of the compression ratio on the user experience. Is there any interest of OTT in it? Yeah, of course. But you know, um, okay. So you know, um, let let me let me tell you a few uh, more things about that. So, uh, um, of course, OTTs are interested in this. Uh, they are interested in many many aspects. One is, of course, how to improve their encoders. So, if you want to improve encoders already even before before uh, transmitting it, if you can have an encoder that has a better rate control in, re in which the distortion uh, that that corresponds to a given rate, you could measure with a good objective metric is already a very, very good thing, right? Then this way you could have encoders that are much, much more efficient uh, and that's great. But then there are a number of other things that come because this is not really user experience only dimension. User experience also means, for instance, what happens if I switch channel. If I switch channel, go from one channel to another one, there is a very, very big difference on user experience if I wait half a second versus if I make five seconds. So in that case, uh, the type of measure you make is not the same thing. So the metric here is what is the delay between switching two things. Also, um, uh, the 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 um, uh, at least a lot of uh, over the top uh, providers like Netflix etc. They really have no control on what is the bandwidth that uh, the, the the effective bandwidth through the internet that uh, the customer receive. So there may there may be um, uh, um, big variations. So again, this is another thing, right? So this is not what is the quality, but how much the quality changes, and whether you actually get to the point where you will stop. So these are the different metrics, basically, that that are used. And indeed, this is this is a lot used in in uh, in in, uh, in in companies like uh, like Netflix, for instance, uh, and uh, also, in fact, Google itself, right? Because uh, you could say that YouTube is also a OTT, right? So um, yeah, so this is this is a big, big, uh, big area. But this is not something that that MPEG looks at, right? And as far as I know, there is not much work in uh, any standardization around that. These are things that companies do. You don't need to have a standard. In fact, if you can have a metric, you want to keep it for yourself. It's a very good metric because if your competitor knows about that metric, maybe they they can do the same thing. So. So that's why um, also you know standardization of metrics for quality it does not always need to be standardized. Yeah, sometimes it is necessary, sometimes it's not. So we have a network planning models such as ITUT G1071 give you. A MOS for certain network characteristic and encoding setting. Okay, so that's a comment. Okay, yeah, but mean opinion score by definition has its own difficulties, right? Because um, there is this famous joke, right? If I put uh, somebody half of the body inside ice and the other half in a in a hot oven. In average, the mean opinion score is okay. So the mean opinion score is not always a, a good metric, especially for user experience, because experience is very user dependent. So you don't want to average it. Okay, we have one more. What should be added with? Oh no, not necessarily added. So the question is, what should be added with mean opinion score? Well, sometimes mean opinion score doesn't even mean anything, right? So if you are interested in serving a particular person in a particular uh, uh, location, then you don't need a mean opinion score. You just want to know that particular person. Now. It depends on a lot of things. So this is why uh, why I said a mean opinion score is not necessarily answer 
to, to all the problems. So it's not necessarily even useful. Right? So it's not a question of adding something to mean opinion score. There are some cases, of course, you can you can do mean opinion score, but, uh, but there are many cases you don't actually have mean opinion score. In most uh, applications where you are really interested what is the impact of a content in terms of user experience um, on a specific uh, uh, customer, client, it's not mean opinion score that you have to calculate. It's not adding something to it. It's actually not using mean opinion score. Can 3D video be personalized, optimized for a specific person's need? Uh, well, yeah, so this is what some people um, say. Uh, now, uh, at least in the case of uh, uh, stereoscopic uh, uh, video, many people believe that because the distance between the two eyes of different individuals are different. Uh, so if you have set up your your uh, your coding system for an, let's say an average um, uh, distance between the two eyes uh, and optimize everything for that. If your if your eyes are closer or farther, depending on how closer or farther uh, they are from each other, you may get nausea, you may you may get headache and things like that. So in fact, in that sense, yes, it is. It has to be uh, it has to be personalized. And some people actually even have tried this. Yeah, uh, estimated mean opinion score uh, or mean opinion score uh, measured. Um, yeah, they can be, you know, if you don't have anything, of course, you use mean opinion score. But uh, what I was uh, saying here is that um, you could, uh, you could, um, you could actually even get rid of mean opinion score in many, many uh, 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 cases, you are not interested in knowing what is what an average user is perceiving. You want to know what is a particular specific person uh, 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 experiencing. Uh, now, of course, uh, the whole paradigm of quality of service is heavily relying on mean opinion score. That's, that's how it has been. And this was, it made sense that one starts from that point, right? Um, but, uh, but now, uh, if you really want to go one step farther than the quality of service, it's not just enough to say, okay, that service, I used to measure it by PSNR, now I'm going to measure it with MMIS, SSIM, right? You, 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 you have to do more. And often, what you really want to do is to know what is the user that particular user's experience. Yeah. Yes, left and right. Uh, uh, so, so the other question that is uh, uh, bringing, yeah. So I think we are basically discussing and uh, and saying left and right could be also, yeah. Is JPEG using no reference metric for some evaluations? Um, no, often JPEG itself, because it has the original, when it evaluates things in terms of compression efficiency, it doesn't use no reference metrics. But there are cases where you do not have that. That's true, uh, but not in JPEG. So in the development of JPEG, never no reference metrics were used, because you always have the original. So why not use it? Okay, I think we have run out of questions. Oh, we still have one more question, I think. Oh, no, that, that's just not possible. Okay, so I... Oh, um, this is still something.
Okay, basically, I was just pointing out that uh, I suppose that for today we have run out of questions. In this case, this officially concludes OSC1. I would like to thank everyone who participated in the first OSC. I would also like to encourage the participants for the future if you happen to come across any question or comment during the OSC presentation, feel free to already post it in the chat and it will be discussed and addressed after the presentation itself. So again, thank you everyone for participating and the next OSC will take place exactly one week from now in the same place and same time. If you have any question in the meantime regarding the next OSC or any of the following OSCs from 1 to 4, please do not hesitate to write me an email. And I see that still multiple attendees are typing. Let us see what is going. Okay, thank you very much. Everybody. Okay, so in this I officially conclude the first OSC. Um, session. See you everyone one week from now. All the information are available in the wiki and has been publicly sent out to the QOE net mailing list previously. Thank you and see you one week from now.